I'd introduce our speakers. So uh, Gillian Davies um, is a senior ecologist um, uh, at BSC Group in Worcester, Massachusetts, where her work focuses on climate change and wetlands, uh, working with local communities um, to develop nature-based solutions uh, with a particular focus on wetland, forest and soil conservation and restoration. Um, she uh, also uh, is a visiting scholar at Tufts University Global Development and Environment Institute, serves as one of the founding co-leads of the Society of Wetland Sci Scientists, Rights of Wetlands Initiative and uh, SWS Climate Change and Wetlands Initiative. Um, and um, Kai um, is, uh, uh, works for the, um, uh, the CELDF. Um, the Com Community Environmental Land Defence Fund. Is that, is that right? Um, it's close. Not close. <laughs> um, uh, he, he's um, uh, a, a board member as well for the Oregon Community Rights Network um, and um, uh, kind of uh, particularly works with community rights groups in the Western United States, uh, including Hawaii, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and Washington. Um, as well as advising on international legal rights of nature projects. Uh, and uh, finally, we have um, uh, Dr. Um, Ritesh Kumar, um, who has led integrated management planning for several wetlands in, South, in the Southeast Asia region uh, and coordinated multidisciplinary projects on uh, wetlands assessment, ecosystem services evaluation, water management, sustainable livelihoods, uh, disaster risk reduction, and climate change adaptation. Um, uh, he's been involved in several global, regional, and national assessments, um, including one of the coordinating lead authors of the ITBEST regional assessment on status of biodiversity and ecosystem services for Asia and Pacific, um, and also uh, has been closely associated with um, the Ramsar Convention process. Um, so from that, you'll already get this is such an exciting kind of multidisciplinary um, project, which I, I think is is really awesome, um, uh, combining sort of um, sort of the natural sciences, the legal and, and side of things, and really uh, combining those into a effective sort of um, theory for change. And I think that's what we'll be hearing about today, kind of what what the what of the uh, of the rights of wetlands approach, but then also the kind of operate operate operationalization of that as well <laughs> if I can get my words out um, and that's really exciting so without further ado I will um, hand over to our speakers thank you very much for joining us today hi Jean, sorry I my mouse was uh, not behaving well and I couldn't unmute <laughs> um, so I, I'll now share my screen um, and Let's see. Okay, and okay, I'm I'm just gonna have to do it this way with the um with a little bit of the extra showing. I hope that's all right. Um. So um, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm going to talk about an idea that represents a paradigm shift for how much of the world relates to nature and wetlands. Um, in other words, a, a recognition of the rights and legal personhood and living beingness of wetlands as a means of responding to the climate and biodiversity emergency. Um, the shift in our relationship with wetlands and nature could realign the ethical and legal framework for that relationship with the goal of leading to a significant reduction in the destruction and degradation of wetlands and contributing to achieving a livable climate and stemming the loss and degradation of biodiversity, including wetlands. I'll discuss how this idea came about, including the lessons we've been learning from many indigenous peoples and local communities around the world, as well as discussing what we've accomplished and what we hope to achieve. Um, okay, so now... Um, And before I get further started, I'd like to acknowledge that the land from which I've prepared this presentation in Acton, Massachusetts, USA, is on the traditional territory of the Neshoba, 
and Nipmuc tribal people who inhabited these lands and were forcibly removed from them by European colonizers. And with this land acknowledgement, I recognize the violence inherent in the separation of a people from their land and the conflict and suffering that this continues to create through generations to the present moment. We're all seeing a present day attempt to remove, displace and kill the people of Ukraine playing itself out um, in Europe and similarly attempting to destroy a people and their relationship with the land of their ancestors. Our relationship with the land, with forests, wetlands and other elements of biodiversity, including people is fundamental to our health and well-being, to our identities and to our planetary survival. The Earth's web of life, our, our common wealth, creates ecological and climatic balance and provides the basis for our resilience to climate change and other challenges. The recent 2021 IPBES IPCC joint report makes it very clear that the climate and biodiversity emergencies are dire. And even these state governmental bodies are calling for transformative change as the only path out of our predicament and recognizing that neither the climate nor the biodiversity emergency can be solved alone. They need to be addressed together. This is key. They need to be viewed as two sides of the same coin and addressed together. As you likely know, wetlands store a disproportionate amount of the world's soil carbon and therefore are a key element in finding solutions to the climate and biodiversity emergencies. Yet wetlands continue on a downward trajectory despite the efforts of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands for the past 50 years and various national and subnational efforts to conserve, restore and protect wetlands. According to the 2020 WWF Freshwater Living Planet Index, almost one in three freshwater species are threatened with extinction. All freshwater taxonomic groups are at greater risk of extinction than terrestrial taxonomic groups. In fact, world scientists have been warning uh, humanity very explicitly for decades. Tens of thousands of scientists from around the world have signed these warnings and a key element of the warnings is a call for a new ethic, a call for all people, including scientists, to take action. The warnings um, call on, let's see, the warnings call upon scientists to speak up about what we know and to develop new approaches. Let's see, actually. Sorry, I'm. All right. Um, one sec. So, we're reminded of our moral and ethical responsibilities, we can respond with a vision of transformational change. Um, as called for by the chair of IPBES and many indigenous peoples and local communities. We can call for a fundamental paradigm shift in the human wetlands relationship and ethical and legal shift through recognition of the inherent rights of wetlands based on their living beingness and membership in the earth community. And as a wetlands focused response to the rights of nature movement, which is being recognized by several courts, legislatures and international governance institutions around the world as a way to restore our relationship with nature. Let's see. So this map is uh, shows the historical and geographical context for the expansion of the circle of rights holders and the recognition of rights of, of nature. And we found that recognition of rights of nature occurs all over the globe and throughout millennia of human history. The declaration is based on the idea that wetlands are entities entitled to inherent and enduring rights which derive from their existence as members of the earth community and should possess legal standing in courts of law.
Let's see. The idea for universal declaration of the rights of wetlands also emerged in part from what we've learned from indigenous peoples and local communities and from the historical and current rights of nature movements. I want to acknowledge that my comments are those of a non-indigenous person and I don't want to speak for indigenous peoples, but rather I'm reflecting on what I've learned from some of them. Recognition of the living beingness and personhood of, um, of nature is often a central element of indigenous culture. Robin Wall Kimmerer explains in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, that Potawatomi language grants animacy to nature, including whole ecosystems, thus acknowledging a reciprocal relationship and rights. In contrast, English only grants animacy to humans and thus distances us from other forms of life and distances us from moral and legal obligation to other organisms and ecosystems. Where we might say to someone who's stressed out, go for a walk in the woods, Potawatomi elders would advise to go among the standing people, which implies a fundamentally different relationship, one among equals, one where the walker has something to learn from the standing people. Deriving in part from the wisdom of indigenous peoples and in part from a Western history of advocating for the rights of nature, such as the voices of Henry David Thoreau, John Muir, Christopher Stone, Roderick Nash, and Thomas Berry, the emerging rights of nature movement reflects values long held by humans of many cultures around the world. So far, 27 organizations have endorsed the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Wetlands, and if you wish to read the declaration, find out more about it or sign on in support of the declaration, you can visit our website at www.rightsofwetlands.org. We've gotten a lot of uh, positive feedback. Um, the Rights of Wetlands website has a recording of Mamo Rosiano, a Colombian indigenous sage, sharing his thoughts on the declaration as he sits on the banks of Lake Toda, the largest lake in Colombia. Marie Toussaint, a member of the European Parliament, is very interested in the declaration and you can read her thoughts on the website along with those of several other leaders. Fundacion Montecito submitted the Rights of Wetlands article in a Colombian court case about the rights of Lake Toda, but the judge determined that the case was not being heard in the right court, so it did not proceed. The, um, we presented the rights of wetlands at the um, October 2021 11th Intercol International Wetlands Conference based in New Zealand, where conference delegates and organizers endorsed the Otatahi um, resolution to promote the rights of wetlands and the declaration itself, as well as two other elements. In a poll taken during my presentation at the conference, I asked, do you think that transformative change is needed to make the, meet the challenges of the wetlands, biodiversity and climate emergencies? Out of 104 respondents, 99% said yes, 0% said no, and one person or 1% was not sure. We've been in discussion with Ramsar focal points in a number of countries in the hopes that one or more will be willing to sponsor a Ramsar draft resolution. We're in the process of collaborating with the Ecuadorian Sariaco indigenous Quechua people who have a living forest declaration um, with the idea that combining the voices of scientists and indigenous people may be stronger than each of us alone in our efforts to reach others about the importance of shifting the relationship with wetlands, forests, and other elements of nature and changing the continued downward trajectory. We can look at the recent rights of nature movement to see what has been accomplished thus far. A particularly significant um, accomplishment was achieved by the New Zealand Maori and occurred with the passing of the Te Awatapua Act in 2017, where the Wanganui River, including wetlands, was granted the legal rights of personhood, and the law also recognized the special relationship with the Maori, uh, Iwi, and the river. In terms of wetlands, in addition to the very specific rivers and lakes inclusive of their vegetated bordering wetlands that have been granted rights, 
There now exists a universal declaration of river rights developed by the Earth Law Center, which addresses the rights of riparian wetlands and their watersheds, but not of many other types of wetlands. Um, and the slide shows some of the provisions of the river rights declaration. Interestingly, recent ecological research is learning that nature is more complex and perhaps more sentient than Western science has previously understood. This evolving scientific understanding of the planet's living beings and their relationships while using different language begins to reflect an understanding similar to the understanding of the living beingness and personhood of nature that many indigenous cultures have had for millennia. The idea that nature both as whole ecosystems and as individual beings within those systems has inherent and inalienable rights, animacy and subjectivity may seem unfamiliar or it may seem like something that we've known all along but have been unaware of due to cultural and linguistic biases. If we look at human history, we see that societies that have recognized the rights and subjectivity of nature often have found greater sustainability and balance with nature when compared to those that hold the view of nature as object, whether we're managing nature or out and out exploiting nature. And therefore the rights of nature approach may play a critical role in our ability to respond effectively to the global crises that we face. As Robin Wall Kimmerer said, it's all in the pronouns. If a maple's an it, we can take up the chainsaw. If a maple's a her, we think twice. The Western paradigm got us into this um, wetland, into the wetlands climate and biodiversity emergencies. What have we been missing? Would reconsidering our language and our ethical framework, which are the underpinnings of our legal system, help us find better solutions? Perhaps solutions that have to do with recognizing the living beingness of nature and our role and responsibilities as members of the web of life rather than as resource extractors. I hope you're able to find time to read our article that provides a more detailed rationale and context for the proposed Universal Declaration of the Rights of Wetlands. And I hope you have a chance to walk among the standing people sometime this week. So, um, and that's, I'll stop the share now. These next slides are for the next session. Kai will be sharing his screen. Yeah, oh, good. Okay, good. Uh, and uh, hopefully you can see the screen. So, uh, I'm calling in or I guess zooming in from uh, the United States, Northwest section of it, uh, specifically in Spokane, Washington, um, traditional lands of the, the Spokane tribe, but also a big meeting grounds of many other uh, tribes because of the prolific salmon runs that used to exist in this area, unfortunately don't anymore. Uh, primarily because of uh, damming of rivers that have uh, literally blocked the, the fish from their migration patterns. So um, to kind of continue on uh, Jillian's great setup on just sort of the, the reality of how this all came together, the conception of it, the necessity of it. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of sort of inside the process of sort of where things have gone since putting that declaration forward. You know, clearly having a, a you know a literal place in this sense, this idea of the transformation of of really being uh, cognizant of of nature's beingness and that systems, human systems, I should say, uh, needing to be in recognition of that, uh, you know, needs to go further than just obviously the declaring of it. You know, what are we going to do about it, basically? So what I going to walk through here really is sort of the what we call sort of the moving into action on behalf of the rights of wetlands and there'll be elements that I will repeat um, in in brief though of, of what Jillian had already mentioned and here is really just that you know taking the call to action putting it into motion and the three bullet points you see here are all pulled from the declaration of uh, the rights of wetlands uh, and I pulled these three specifically because the work really is now leading to how do you take this, this view, this shift, uh, this sort of value assertion uh, and put it into operation? Uh, and this is largely being driven towards the creation of legal realities, whether it's you know, national level law, local level law, constitutional law, whatever it may be. You know, how do we do this transformational shift in a way that articulates that? 
because ultimately laws are really just rules that are supposed to reflect, reflect hopefully collective values uh, and unfortunately largely um, environmental laws, at least in the United States, reflect the value of really extraction and destruction, not so much about conservation and sort of mutual or har harmonistic sort of relationship to the natural world. Um, and of course, as Gillian pointed out, that the reasons for doing so are, are dire with the extreme loss of, of wetlands, the degradation going on. Uh, and then, as I mentioned just a second ago, the reality that existing systems really have, have failed to do the work that's necessary. And the shift is uh, in some ways the natural evolution of where we've been uh, and sort of an indication of where we need to go. So, you know, that's kind of where everything sort of moved then from the declaration work. And as you may have noticed in one of the slides, just the, the diversity of those that were involved. And I think that's a, a key piece, especially as, as you and those that are joining here today, maybe diving into the rights of peatlands, you know, looking at, well, who's involved in sort of moving that process forward? You know, do you start, for instance, with a declarations for the rights of peatlands and then move into this process that we've been in here uh, collectively on sort of the articulation of that and, and the other steps that are necessary to, to make this a reality. And so this is a screen here of the bullet points are just a, a small smattering of those that have been involved to show the sort of the diversity, you know, the backgrounds were coming from, you know, different parts of the planet. Um, and so I think that has been a real strength um, you know, our organization has been involved in rights of nature work, sort of from this Western legal construct to kind of, again, echo Jillian's presentation about how customary traditional uh, systems law societies have already had that orientation from their inception. Uh, the Western construct, of course, has not. So um, that Western move towards the rights of nature and that thinking and that sort of standing and the way that needs to happen uh, has largely been driven by those with more of a, of a legal framework, I would say. Um, and so to have this mix of, of, of people, specialities, and of course, sort of regional affiliations, I think has been quite critical and quite uh, important to the process of the rights of wetlands work that's been going on. So again, I think a word of advice on the rights of peatlands work to make sure that you're looking to do that uh, as well. Um, and, you know, Jillian, again, we'll get into this in more detail. I just want to highlight a little bit about, you know, where have we gone in this process? And just to give you a sense, this has been going on, I, I think, over for a year now. We're getting to the point of, of completing this sort of first phase of, of, of work, uh, creating sort of a, an overview, a pamphlet uh, to sort of share with others about where this needs to go. So, again, this progression, this movement towards making it a reality, both on the ground and of course within policy itself. So, you know, I think a big piece uh, is, is really, okay, looking at, let's say the, the actually intrinsic inherent needs of wetlands and making sure that there's the right kinds of articulations of what is meant by that. Um, and I think as that third, uh, you know, or second bullet point points to, you know, always, you know, being at the center of really what are the, human systems have really just been concerned about human interface with the natural world, which unfortunately has been um, in larger volume about controlling, extracting, and in that process really undermining the capability of ecosystems for the, for the sake of human ben benefit, really the short-sightedness of, of human endeavors. And that needs to shift. That's that transformation piece, meaning that we have to understand that we're part of nature uh, we are nature, and we can't just be looking at nature as our, our, uh, our, our place just to consume from. And so, you know, two critical ways of which we've approached sort of the formulation of this, looking at all those individual rights, again, that you may have seen in the screen previous in Jillian's presentation, you know, this question of what does this right mean and why is it important? And then looking at what is the main problem affecting wetlands that this right responds to? Um, and then also making sure that we articulate the rights in a comprehensive manner, but one that also has the ability for organic interpretation. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, often in policymaking, when you're looking at law, at rules, 
uh, there can be a, a rush to be very comprehensive in sort of defining what it is that you want in fear that if you don't do that, things may go sideways. And there's a rationale to that. However, sometimes when you try to overdefine something, you actually miss critical things in the process that don't get defined. And so you're trying to find that balance of being um, comprehensive in the way that you need to, but also having that flexibility that as systems, as humans, you know, as we learn and evolve, uh, that our capability of that sort of policy has that uh, potential as well. And I won't really focus too much on sort of the example. I think it looks like Jillian's going to get to that later, but as you can see here, you know, what is the intrinsic right to be free from pollution and degradation? Uh, and making sure that's articulated in a way that's that's really uh, relevant in this case to the rights of wetland ecosystems. And you may have also noticed, um, and I'll just go back for a second, in the bottom corner, I have, I have different images of wetlands because uh, we may have our own conception of what a wetland is, but if you really start to look in what is a wetland, it, it's really a lot of different realities in the sense of the terrestrial and the aquatic. <clears throat> and so to keep in mind that when we, when we speak of wetlands, it's, it's really a large body of, of, of really ecosystems out there in, in different forms. Um, you know, a big piece is also making sure that we are, uh, again, making sure that the ecosystem is really at the center and trying to have uh, that restraint that humans need in the sense of really looking just at human needs and not really understanding the reality of the ecosystem itself and all the other natural communities that are associated with it. So as part of our effort too, you know, looking at how do we articulate that? How do we remind ourselves in some ways, how do we create uh, the natural boundaries really and not to exceed those? And so this is a, uh, a work in progress of sorts of the, of the group that we have and sort of looking at making sure that as we look at things like wetlands and the protection of it, that we're very, very careful uh, not to exceed those boundaries uh, that as you may read here, that we have this moral, moral duty as well as this legal duty uh, to protect the inherent rights of wetlands. And that uh, if we're going to somehow uh, come up against those in a way that um, may stress that particular ecosystem, let's be very, very careful. And in fact, you know, those kinds of things should indicate to us that we shouldn't even go there in a lot of ways. And I'll talk later towards the end about a particular legal case that just came up recently that really brings in this idea of, of prevention or, or precaution and how we do human endeavors and what that reality is in relation to ecosystems. I think that's my bit to this point. I'll come back in later with some other aspects of rights of nature work. And I think uh, from here, Ritesh is going to speak to other things that are going on in the realm of moving into the action largely about, all right, so here we are sort of putting words to paper. That sounds great. Uh, yeah, we have to work on sort of policy and how does the policy get driven, great. But all the while the degradation, the pressure, uh, the sort of um, you know, movement towards further and further uh, stress or loss of wetlands continues, what do we need to be doing now or what can we be doing now or what is happening now in this rights of nature framework, um, I think is a really, really critical piece because very often our our activism, our, our organizing really is sort of looking at policymakers very often and trying to put pressure on policymakers uh, with the expectation that somehow they're going to come in and, and save us, so to speak. And I think this realization that now we have actually got to do real work uh, and what does that look like? That is um, what Ritesh is going to kind of highlight here in the sense of what is, what is going on. Thanks, Kai. Uh, Sansal uh, briefly uh, walked the participants through some of the work uh, Wetlands International is uh, doing to ensure operationalization of uh, the rights of wetlands. I don't have slides, Kai, for uh, this conversation, so I'd rather speak it out, but I have, do have slides for the values discussions. So essentially, uh, we as Wetlands International recognize uh, that uh, fundamentally wetland conservation over a period of time has 
taken an instrumental approach wherein wetlands conservation is being driven by policies and programs which ultimately see wetlands or even peatlands as inputs to certain human well-being outcomes and gradually we are losing the flair of pushing conservation because nature is respected because nature deserves conservation irrespective of whether or not uh, you know they uh, uh, they contribute to human well-being and as is famously said and and more so recently that economy is a full fully owned subsidiary of of nature so with that principle in mind uh, you know wetlands international in collaboration with several partners is uh, putting in place a darwin application uh, the application will be uh, is intending to work uh, in uh, different uh, setups primarily in the global south wherein uh, we develop the enabling environment for implementing rights of nature now historically what we have believed that rights of nature is not something new it has existed within societies for time immemorial all we need to do is to dig the roots so that people have faith that this movement and and this process works so the project uh, will be looking in in my side of the world i am based out of delhi in south asia so it will be um, it will be working in colombo wetlands we are looking at sites in ecuador and and other parts uh, essentially we are looking at the roots of community management of wetlands and how far uh, these are aligned, they support the rights of wetlands, and um, we intend using uh, the policy reviews and, and case studies to develop a guidance uh, for wetlands managers, for policymakers to implement uh, these uh, rights in practice. There are legal approaches, but there are non-legal approaches also to say that right of wetlands should uh, become a part and parcel of all programs related to wetlands, irrespective of whether you use a court to justify these rights, but the basic intent of protecting, respecting, and living from and living with these rights it is the essential principle that Wetlands International and our partners adhere to. Over to you, Kai. Okay. Am I up, uh, or Jillian, are you up? I'm trying to recall um, where I, we are in the process. I might, I might be um, up next, and I can uh, share my screen again. Um, I, I think if I can get this, uh, I've been, I'm. Apologize, everyone. I've I've really been having trouble with my mouse. It's not uh, not behaving very well. So let me let me see if I can do this. Um, it's uh, um, you know what? One thing we could do is is just uh, just as Ritesh um, was just talking. I can just just talk a bit because um, I'm having difficulty with the screen sharing. Basically what we wanted to do um, with this group, uh, especially since you all are, are considering uh, writing a declaration of the rights of peatlands, which is fabulous. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, and we're, we're hoping there'll be some synchronicity um, with the rights of the Declaration of the Rights of Wetlands and and a Declaration of the Rights of Peatlands, so that they would be um, mutually supportive of each other. And as part of that, also as as was mentioned, we're working on a, a document that um, to look at how to implement or operationalize the rights in the real world. And we're just really interested in in hearing from you all in that regard. Um, and we were gonna talk a little bit about how we are approaching that. And we've, um, we're, we have it kind of broken down into what does this right mean? And what is, why is it important? Um, an example of, of one of the rights is, is that wetlands have an intrinsic right to have naturally occurring biodiversity free of introduced or invasive species that disrupt their ecological integrity. Um, 
And so we explain what that right means and why it's important um, that it's the right to naturally occurring biodiversity is fundamental to the health and well being and survival of life on Earth as well as wetlands. And that includes humans. Um, so we're trying to get away from that separating humans and nature. Um, and as biodiversity is, which is the diversity of life, as that's lost, species that depend on each other become less resilient and ecosystem degrade and lose their functional capacity. Um, so that's, that's why it's an important, right? Um, wetlands are some of the most biodiverse ecosystems on earth. Um, a large percentage of species, about 40% of all species depend on wetlands for at least part of their life cycle. Um, so that's particularly why it's important for wetland to have that right. Um, and it's, it's a right that's essential to ensuring a, rights, a wetland's right to exist. And that's our first right is the right to exist. But what does the right to exist mean? The other seven rights are supporting rights that are necessary to allow existence through time um, and, and one way that I think about it is, is that biodiversity is like a fabric. It's, it's, and if you can, maybe you can pull one or two threads out, but, but if you're pulling as many threads out of that weaving as are being lost today with the sixth grade extinction that's going on, your fabric starts to just come apart. Um, and that's the, the link to biodiversity. Um, and then this right is linked to other rights, like particularly if you're going to support biodiversity, you need to be free from pollution and degradation, which is right number seven. You need to have a um, natural and connected and sustainable hydrologic regimes, which is right number three, if you're a, a wetland. Um, and the right to ecologically sustainable climatic conditions, which is right number four. So we're kind of weaving these rights together. And then we talk about what's the main problem affecting wetlands that the right responds to. The main problem is that we're in the midst of the Holocene extinction, the sixth mass extinction event on the planet's history, um, with a rate, an extinction rate many times higher than the natural extinction rates that would be happening otherwise. And wetland species are particularly hard hit, as I mentioned earlier. And then we, we are going to provide one example um, and an example of how this right could be brought into reality would be, um, it might start with a public education campaign to educate property owners in a community about the rights of wetlands and this right in, per in particular, especially the importance and benefit of planting native species. Um, rather than non-native ornamentals. And then besides that sort of voluntary effort, um, there could be a local ordinance that gets passed requiring property owners to plant a certain percent of their landscaping with native species. Um, and then commercial property owners could be required to plant 100% of their species. Or you could incentivize it. You could say homeowners could receive a tax rebate if they plant 100% native species. So we're trying to create um, examples on the ground of like, what would you do with that, right? Um, so I'll pass it now to Ritesh. And, and we'd like to, in the discussion period that comes up, we'd love to hear your thoughts about that approach. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Shilin. Uh, I will attempt to share my screen. Okay. Okay, so uh, continuing with the uh, discussions in the session, I uh, pitched this on uh, where does rights of nature, rights of wetland fit within the broader 
discourse around uh, wetland wise use, which is the Ramsar Convention speak, most importantly because the convention itself provides a, an international platform to pursue the conservation agenda. And uh, as we have seen, the worldviews around wetlands have been shifting. Uh, way back, we started with the duck stamps, the new language on uh, you know wetlands being the bloodstream of biosphere comes in. And in the last COP, uh, 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 when uh, we went in Dubai, uh, a resolution around wetlands and peace was negotiated. So how we are looking at wetlands has been shifting over a period of time from being a very esoteric subject as a habitat of species, wetlands are being recognized for several things. But all said and done, uh, you will notice subtle instrumentality in framing the worldviews which shape our interactions with these ecosystems. Now, when we look at uh, the wise use definition, which is the core philosophy of Ramsar Convention, it talks about the definition goes like wise use is the maintenance of ecological character. And that's where, you know, uh, the rights of a wetlands initiative and several others, we start questioning that why is uh, all definition uh, looking at ecological character? Can a wetland not have multiple characters, including characters independent of humans? Uh, when we talk of maintenance, what are we trying to maintain? Is it condition, is it trajectory of change or something else? And uh, when we talk of ecological character being a combination of components, processes and benefit services that characterize the wetland at a given point in time, do we intend to mean a reference condition and can that reference condition be defined by humans perception or is it something that is taken as a reference point which, which could be without humans, which could be the natural state of wetlands. And we also recognize that the way we look at uh, you know any ecosystem is also dependent on uh, our, our lens from which we are using it you could either consider yourselves as uh, uh, living from nature which is a very instrumental uh, logic or you could talk about living in nature wherein you consider yourselves being part of the nature or living with nature which is a dialogue of coexistence so the subtlety of all of this frames are definitions constructs and and several frames that uh, you know we we use to develop or or express our connections with uh, ecosystems including nature this is picked up from ipbs uh, assessment report on diverse values of and valuation of nature when an i was one of the coordinating lead authors so let's look at the picture of a wetland then. So where are the rights of uh, wetlands? So uh, this is a photograph from a Ramsar site from Chilika. And in one frame, you can see people fishing in the, in the wetlands. You have gulls uh, all around this boat, which are waiting to eat the fish. And you can see the small tail of a dolphin, you know. And, and let's, let's imagine this. This is the frame which, which is there in most of our wetlands. What is it? The, where do we draw a line? And what, should we actually be separating humans uh, and nature in any ways? So if you frame this relationship, uh, you can see it from a very intrinsic lens, the wetlands as it exists, the components and processes language. You could look at it from the instrumental lens wherein people uh, are fishing in the wetland to derive incomes, but you could also see the relationality between people and nature, the identity of these fishermen, of being a fisherman in Chilika. It's not about just getting fish from anywhere. It is their deities, it is their totems, it is their religious practices, everything coexisting. It is their identity. And, and drawing a line somewhere, to me, seems meaningless. The challenge now is to understand this connectivity in a way. So how do we define ecosystems then? And this is where we have to bring in within one frame, the ecosystem as it exists, the social systems that are linked with it and governance systems that connect these two. And we should recognize that wetland acquires a character by all these interactions. It is not just the ecology, it is all about ecology and people meeting to the, together, giving wetland a character which, which we intend to maintain. So within this, the right of wetland to exist without people, 
the existence of people with the wetlands and the existence of people themselves for instrumentality all becomes a part of the same spectrum. Over a period of time, we have, uh, you know, we have shifted the narrative towards the latter end, forgetting that ecosystem or its own rights also become very fundamental to the way wetland character is defined within the convention text. And this allows us to do something which is called a wise use operating space. Uh, if, if in any of these uh, you know, spaces, we violate the rights of nature, we, we enter into a threshold which, which then shifts the system. So maintaining the rights is, is something very critical to achieving wise use in the, in the convention, convention uh, space. We will be more than happy to receive feedback. Uh, the central ideas that are presented here are... Uh, so, Gillian, that was it. I hope it nourishes the discussion. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Ritesh. Um, so, I was going to just bring up a, a few potential barriers um, in um, that come up for rights of wetlands in our current status quo, where so much, uh, so many societies, not all societies, um, view humans as being um, superior to nature and separate from nature. And so I'll just run through um, a, a few of those potential barriers. One is um, that our, our socioeconomic system is based on a view of nature as property, sort of private ownership and um, the capitalist system too. And that, and that sort of creates or contributes to or comes from the dualistic view of, of humans over here and wetlands over, or nature over there. Um, and so we need to move past that. Um, another potential obstacle is the monetization of the natural world so that uh, in, there is one approach to trying to protect nature by saying that it has a certain economic value. And so therefore we shouldn't harm it because it has this economic value, but that's staying within the nature as property or and the status quo view. It's not really shifting the view that nature has inherent value, inherent rights, and an inherent living beingness that we need to um, work with and, and sort of have more of the um, character view that Ritesh has just discussed where humans aren't excluded, they're just part of the weaving, part of the fabric. Um, and a problem with the monetized view is that what if nature isn't doesn't get assigned an economic value as high as it needs to be to allow the protection to happen, or we, we consistently underestimate the economic value of nature is the other thing because we don't fully understand it. Um, and we don't realize all of the ways that it's supporting life. And then another potential uh, barrier obstacle is merging rights of nature or rights of wetlands approaches with existing environmental regulation because the existing general approach to environmental regulation is a process of allowing pollution and degradation and destruction of nature, um, but then requiring something. Maybe you allow less than full degradation, but you allow some or you in wetlands, um, if you impact a wetland in the United States, the regulatory system says you have to create a new one. Well, the, the new wetland cannot immediately function the same way that the impacted wetland did. So it's Im impossible to really fully in a timely way replace those functions. And the same with the forest, when you cut the forest, even if you allow it to regrow or plant new trees, it's going to take a hundred years or, or more for the trees to mature. And during that hundred years, you've permanently lost all of what the wetland is doing and you've lost 
you're operating from a different place where you're not recognizing the inherent value that that forest has as a living being. Um, and then another one is um, in asserting rights of nature, nature um, detrimentally discounting human rights. Um, and again, I think Ritesh's talk addresses that. Um, and there are different types of rights. Some rights are considered absolute rights. Other rights are prima facie rights, which the prima facie rights can be overcome. You may need to um, supersede those rights in certain circumstances for a higher moral value. Um, and then um, another task is to evaluate existing terms to see if they're appropriate for legal rights of nature. So in some cases, uh, um, wetlands or, or other elements of nature have been granted legal personhood. And there's a, a potential downside to that, which is that then the the wetland, for instance, could be held accountable for damages. Say the wetland floods some neighboring properties. Well, then is the wetland somehow legally accountable for that? Well, that doesn't quite seem right. So um, that's that's an area to work to work that to work that through. Um, and then another model has been um, guardianship, similar to how a child has rights, uh, legal rights, but they can't represent themselves in court. So they get a guardian. And that was a key element of the Wanganui uh, River um, Te Awatapu Act in New Zealand, that it also became a vehicle for the Maori and the New Zealand government to share um, stewardship of the river that the well, Maori got to appoint a guardian and the New Zealand government got to appoint a guardian and both of those guardians are charged with acting purely on behalf of of the river so and that model needs to be um, I know Kai has some thoughts on that um, you know worked out to to a greater degree but it that model allowed a real breakthrough. The Maori have been advocating for the recognition of the living beingness and rights of the Wanganui River and their relationship with it since the 1870s. And this agreement finally broke the logjam and created a way for the New Zealand government and the Maori to work together for and with the river being fully recognized in the way that the Maori wanted it to be recognized. Um, so that's, um, that is, uh, yeah, that's what I would have to say. And I just got to notice that my battery's running low. I'm sorry, again, I'm doing this from another conference, which has made this really challenging because I'm not in my home office. And um, actually when I, turned my screen off after my first presentation. I got rained on and had to move. So I'm, I'm going to try to move again and find a place where I can plug my computer in and I'll hand it over to Kai and Ritesh. I was about to say, and hopefully you're not gonna sue nature for raining on your, your computer. <laughs> yes, I will not sue the clouds for raining on my parade here. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to finish this out just sort of in the formal presentation aspect and then we'll we'll hopefully get into some robust discussion. So, this is really kind of a a, a more of a global bigger picture just on rights of nature in general, uh, bringing in rights of wetlands, rights of peatlands, other ecosystems, um, just to give those who may not be as familiar a sense of of sort of what it is, where it's come from, where it's headed. Uh, definitely what uh, Jillian was just bringing up and Ritesh just on what the considerations are are highly important. Uh, this is a very, very short list of, of a lot of rights of nature work that's happened. I just pulled a few out, uh, as you can read here. Um, and again, this is all in sort of the Western view context, you know, clearly traditional customary ways uh, have already had what we call a rights of nature orientation. Uh, they uh, different peoples probably would call it something very different, but the relatability there, this is really coming out of the fact that we've had this property view of the world and rights of nature is really about reversing that. So the highlights here um, sort of point more towards that. Christopher Stone, as, as 
uh, Jillian mentioned was a law professor here in the United States that sort of posed the question around, uh, you know, nature being rightless and how movements work to actually see those who are rightless as being rights bearing, uh, nature really being uh, um, a being that has not been seen in that manner. Uh, 2006, significant in the sense of, at least in the Western legal construct, the first place to actually adopt a rights of nature law. Uh, this actually came out of rural Pennsylvania in 2006. Uh, and that action uh, influenced or informed, I should say, to a degree, uh, the Ecuadorian constitutional rewrite that brought in rights of nature to their national document that took place two years later. Uh, Jillian mentioned already in 2017, the New Zealand uh, you know, compact there with the Maori and the Wanganui River, uh, very significant in the sense of exactly what Jillian was pointing to in the sense of traditional peoples uh, really being recognized, which I think is a lot of what's happening with tribal nations now is uh, at least those that are living under colonial systems of law are trying to interface with that, you know, seeing rights in nature as a means to really um, animate uh, the sovereignty of their people and that relationship they have already had and have always had with the natural world that rights in nature becomes both a means to protect the land, but also as an articulation of that capability to self-determine. Uh, followed in 2018, the White Earth Ban here in North America came the first place to recognize a particular plant species and the rights of that plant species, very significant to their people. And in 2019, uh, the people in Toledo, Ohio passed something called the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, really became the first specific ecosystem, at least in the United States, uh, to be art articulated as being rights bearing. Um, also, as these things move, uh, the courts themselves in different places have been playing a significant role, uh, whether it's been in Colombia, whether it's been India, whether it's been Ecuador and other places, but the courts themselves have been quite interesting in the sense of their uh, movement orientation towards moving towards rights of nature. I point out two cases here. 2001 was a case in Ecuador, an area called Los Cedros, very significant um, in the sense of what the court said there. I think two big pieces beyond just the support and recognition and securing of rights of nature is uh, actually bringing in prevention and the precautionary principle <clears throat> so that you're evaluating whether or not you know, a human activity should commence in assessing the potential for the damage that it may cause, uh, again, largely towards those inherent intrinsic rights of an ecosystem, um, so that we're not doing it in the aftermath. So much of environmental law today is about uh, one assessing should it happen and how it should happen and making considerations or, or concessions towards allowing it even if it does damage the natural world. And then if it goes beyond that, then we're trying to hold those to account uh, for that damage, which often is damage such that, you know, nature itself may never fully recover in the way that it, it should be allowed to. And so being smarter, really commonsensical about making sure things don't even occur. And I point out the, the next case that just came out this year in, in India, because it is to what Jillian mentioned earlier, where uh, very surprisingly, and in, a, in a, one way, in a good way, recognizing nature as having rights, but in this legal person framework, uh, but with that also assigning the liability to nature that if something occurs that nature somehow is going to be liable in the way that any other legal entity would would potentially be and so there's there's some danger in whether or not um, that should be the model because of the fact of how legal systems look at liability uh, and really that nature in a lot of ways is is not a person in a legal sense it may be a relation in the sense of traditional peoples and so you know, we're in new territory, making sure we have the right kinds of definitions about how rights of nature is going to function. Um, and then legislative bodies, you know, Panama adopted national legislation this past spring on rights of nature. Uh, there was a, a legislator in the state of New York here in the US that introduced a Great Lakes Bill of Rights. And then for those that may have been tracking, uh, Chile is voting actually this coming weekend on Sunday for a new constitution a very rights forward constitution in a lot of ways, uh, including the rights of nature. And so a lot of significant work uh, really in a movement orientation and a transformational orientation happening at a very, very rapid rate. I mean, some people would say not fast enough, but if you look at sort of when ideas were floated and when actions were taken, uh, it's actually moved in a very rapid kind of way. 
<clears throat> clearly more needs to be done, more needs to be shifted. And as Jillian pointed out, there are some very significant barriers to consider. And sort of lastly, you know, these things happen, trans big transformation happens largely from pressure from sort of outside the established systems. Eventually the inside of those systems sort of catch up, but it's really about people power. I really like Ritesh's graph earlier that showed sort of a, a meandering river or a non-straight line to sort of the reality of things. And that's truly, I think, what rights of nature work has been about, will continue to be about, which is it's not going to be a straight line trajectory. It's and it's not really ultimately going to come from the top down. And so we have to be mindful of that, aware of that, be strategic about that, and again, continue that, that pressure uh, in order to, to move towards systems, laws, rules, behavior uh, that really shifts into that ecocentric nature, which rights of nature, I think, is really at the, at the core of that. So it's very exciting, very challenging. And I think um, what I've been seeing as being part of the rights of wetlands group very exciting in the sense of, of how much it's grown, sort of the involvement of, of very diverse groups of people um, from different backgrounds. And I'm hoping and we're hoping that it'll inform your guys' work on the rights of peatlands. And clearly all of us are available beyond just talking about it here to make that, make that happen. So I think that's the end of our, our formal presentation. And Thank you. We, would, we would love for the remaining amount of time to, to engage with everyone here. Uh, yeah, thanks so much um, to all of our, all of our panelists. Uh, that was um, a really uh, great kind of um, covered so much and nice to sort of have um, all three of you kind of speaking. Um, yeah, um, I really like this idea of the, um, the, the, the the rights of nature is kind of um, making the value of of the natural world kind of visible in a way that's not uh, bound necessarily to kind of economic systems. You often hear that as a kind of justification for, um, you know, natural capital or something. Oh, but, you know, it's about we all know it's valuable. We just need to make the. But I really think the rights of nature is, is a great counter to that, which um, uh, which makes nature's values visible, but in a way that's intrinsic and and not necessarily um, bounds this kind of instrumental sort of uh, point uh, uh, side of things. And I, I don't know, it's just great to sort of explore that this this evening. Um, please, anyone, um, I haven't seen any questions in the chat so far, but um, perhaps people are thinking of them. Um, uh, at the moment and writing them down. So I'll kind of maybe kick off with um, just a, a question um, uh, and, 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 and then we can, uh, that hopefully will precipitate some more to come. Um, so I've read a, um, a, a bit about um, sort of, uh, we, we talked about property and like the, the kind of negative kind of side of, of, of viewing the natural world in, in this kind of property sort of um, uh, framework. And, um, uh, but I've, well, there, are, there is also a move like, I suppose, like by, um, by progressive conservationists as opposed to, to kind of use that as a framework, I guess, to, to kind of rethink, I guess, the tenure systems and com complexify kind of these bundles of rights that kind of come with um, uh, uh, legal kind of ownership of, 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 of ecosystems and, 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 and land and, and that and kind of maybe trying even to sort of um, create better sort of um, support and protections for uh for more customary or kind of um, based systems i just wonder where um the uh rights of nature uh, sort of legal kind of um approach um might fit into those um perhaps more uh le those kind of property oriented sort of um frameworks which are less about private property but more you know more Kind of acknowledging sort of collective ownership or or or, or um, these kind of more complex kind of um, rights to, to to the land yeah I mean from if I understanding your your question Jamie I mean what what hit me was that so much of work goes into sort of quote unquote converse conservation right it, largely as a as a mad dash to kind of keep certain areas from being destroyed from the extractive model of how the dominant system works. Um, and so they, you know, people buy out, you know, land in order to protect the land. Um, 
which to me is just, well, it's just an indication of how messed up the system is that we're at that point of having to sort of separate out, you know, land or even whole ecosystems, in some cases, you know, severing it from its reality being connected to others. Like in the US, you have national parks or wilderness areas, and a lot of people think those are great, but, you know, you talk to the indigenous people and, and they'll tell you, why are you shutting out people from those ecosystems for dependence? And I, and I think this is where rights of nature sh is that transformational shift, which hopefully means that those entities transform how they do their work. Um, one last comment there is it's not just nature, so many NGOs, so many nonprofits out there trying to do, again, the good work, and there's nothing wrong with that. It should be lauded, but it's primarily coming from the fact that the dominant systems have created the consequences for those entities to be out there to pick up the pieces. And so I think this is saying, let's be done picking up the pieces. Let's make the full structure be about what it is that we really believe in such that we're working in a better way, a healthier way, a sustainable way, a more just way. Uh, and that's, I think, part of our problem. That's really another barrier in a lot of ways because a lot of conventional groups have a certain view. A lot of them are very well-funded and they continue to do it the same old way. And I think that's another in cases, a lot of hindrance to transformational things like rights of nature. Um, I just wanted to jump in. There's a, a question about um, if there's a, a universal declaration of the rights of wetlands, if there's a need for a declaration of the rights of peatlands. And my response to that is that there can, there's no reason why there can't be. Um, and that there are a whole bunch, there's a declaration of the rights of rivers, there's a declaration of the rights of mother earth. And to me, each of these declarations can speak to a certain group of people. Um, and peatlands has a global large group of people who are very concerned about it, um, both in the scientific research community, in um, the NGO community, in citizens who are interested in, in protecting them and in communities that live in them. And um, so, and I guess what I would ideally hope for is that as, as um, repeat works on writing a declaration of the rights of peatlands that, that you um, read and, and familiarize yourself with the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Wetlands just to understand what already exists out there. And if you want to um, reinforce um, the, sum, the rights on that list that we've come up with that makes sense for peatlands, go right ahead. Um, re reiterate them, reinforce them, um, if possible, endorse the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Wetlands. And then see if you can think of any specific rights that peatlands, that would be unique to peatlands. What rights do peatlands need or want um, that would be different from um, what's listed for rights of wetlands? Because we, we were trying to think broadly, like what right would apply to regardless of which type of wetland you're thinking about. And there might be something very specific to peatlands that's really important. Like the rights, um, the Declaration on the Rights of Rivers has a right to flow. Well, that's really important for rivers, streams, um, you know, any kind of flowing water body. But it's exactly the wrong thing for a permafrost wetland. We do not want the permafrost wetlands to be flowing. <laughs> um, so that's the kind of thing you could think about. Um, and hopefully nothing in our Declaration of the Rights of Wetlands is a problem for peatlands. <laughs> so um, it's a really interesting thing to think about. Um, Thank you replied that the right to stagnant water. <laughs> Yeah, the opposite of the right to flow, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, the right to deep time, Frankie says. Yeah, that's, a, that's a really good, oh, I love that one. The right to sleep. <laughs> yeah. He's a great, yeah. he's incoming, everyone. 
Ritesh, did you have anything to add on that with um, a peatland specific kind of uh, declaration? If not, then we'll move into our questions, but just, just if, you, if you have any thoughts. So Jamie, I'm an economist by training. And when I began my career some 25 years ago, I was, uh, you know, putting values everywhere. Uh, living in a world that if you get those values right, I'll be able to negotiate a space for wetlands in, in the broad development paradigm. And now I've run out of time and energy. Is, is the, the matter of respect uh, has suddenly disappeared. Uh, people think if, if you get the economic value right, the economies would work to conserve it. But this utilitarian framing of conservation, it's not just about wetlands, about entire nature conservation is possibly one of the, the roots of uh, failure of policies and programs. Everywhere, the first paragraph of the intent to conserve begins with what nature does to humans. Now the time is to turn it around and say nature needs to be respected as is, whereas be it for people, be it without people. And that's the fundamental thing that right of nature rights of wetlands it's it's a new it, it, it's it's a frame which existed for time for you know in in several societies we're just trying to bring it to the fore and say okay this narrative is also important and possibly the dominant one today we we are a part of nature we are nature and when we are conserving nature we are conserving us and and that's the ethos that should stand by any intent uh, to develop a legal system and and beware this is not just about the courts recognizing it is also about we as conservation organizations recognizing this and bringing it uh, into practice in letter and spirit yeah. thank you yeah that's brilliant thank you um iren would you like to ask your questions Hi, yes, I just wanted to make a quick clarification, actually, um, as someone who's working on the, on Beatfest. Um, so we are starting this sort of like emergent campaign um, around rights of peatlands, but haven't decided on any type of format yet, but it will be a declaration or community organizing, or rather going into a peatland justice rather than a peatland uh, right direction. Uh, so just a clarification that we haven't settled anything yet and this entire Peak Fest is a big exploratory journey where we just hope to collect as many perspectives and ideas as possible which will probably help us solve this puzzle of how we can best approach um, I guess peatland justice and peatland organizing. So I just wanted to uh, clarify that briefly and thank you so much for your work everybody. Yeah well hopefully the um... Universal Declaration of the Rights of Wetlands will be a useful tool for you. And we would love to hear. Um, please let us know if it's useful to you and if you are able to use it or the article, the, the um, published article about, um, which is towards a Universal Declaration of the Rights of Wetlands and it's published in um, Marine and Freshwater Science, that publication. Um, that article provides a a science-based rationale for this and um, it has quite a lot of references to back up so if you're looking for science to support what you're doing um, that's a good reference article for you and there's some supplementary material there's a separate document that you can get from the website with the article um, that provides that timeline that I mentioned um, about some of the history of the expansion of the circle of rights holders and rights of nature through time and across cultures. And one thing that's useful is um, to point out to people is that even if you look at human rights, the circle of who gets included in the circle of rights holders has expanded over time. And there, you know, there was a time when the king or the queen really had all the rights, you know? And then gradually it became a few wealthy uh, male landowners. Um, and now it's much broader than that. And, and so um, that's a good perspective because then people can see it's the spectrum and, and granting rights to nature is just, it's the next step. Mm -hmm. And the idea of nature deserving rights is maybe as um, radical to us as 
the granting of rights to women was at one point in time or the granting of rights to children or you know on and on or yeah ending slavery yeah. <laughs> so Katie Holston has shared some um, uh, a really nice quote from uh, Ursula K. Le Guin there, um, sort of touching on what you just said, Gillian. We live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change often begin in art, and very often in our art, the art of words. I think Katie's also um, said that it, uh, uh, the your article has been very useful and they hope to use it uh, as a template for um, the declaration. Um, uh, and uh, the Friends of R.D. Bog, we're uh, celebrating the rights of peatland on the island of Ireland um, on the September the 25th as part of their Bog Cafe Festival. Uh, so if anyone's around R.D. Bog, September, end of September, then uh, head down, head down to the uh, it's so the Bog Cafe Festival, um, and uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, things picking up on stuff we've talked about today and in this session. Um, uh, but yeah, um, so we've got a few more minutes. So, um, uh, and uh, there's, you know, uh, obviously still so much more <laughs> to, to, to talk about, really. Um, but um and I don't think there's, um, are there any, is there anything more in the, uh, Deborah Curtis shared um, the group Client Earth. Um, they're working at speed on many different environmental legal cases. Um, so they might have some understanding of fast tracking this process um, for the rights of nature. Um, I suppose that's a, that's a, in, uh, uh, in terms of the operationalization of this, so <laughs> strong with that word again. Um, do you do you uh, see? And I guess it's kind of comes back to this sort of again, what a lot of people sort of um, use as justification for this kind of more like I guess like economic rationale or kind of you know using the things that like uh, these systems or, or value systems are already in this this kind of system baked into to, to, to whatever you're dealing with it's kind of you know there it's expediency right it's like they're there let's just use those and then we can you know triage or whatever and i suppose this um does that concern you with um making with a with a sort of um more transformative approach with um what the kind of uh, the rights of nature kind of is taking um is is that um sort of uh that uh speed kind of or a concern for you or do you, or i guess there's so much um so you give so many inspirational sort of like examples of stuff that's happened so far that like it is happening and it's gaining pace um as a concept but um uh, I just wonder how you how you kind of cope with that when when people kind of throw that up as maybe maybe an argument um, uh, here or there. Yeah, I mean, I, first off, I think rights of nature or ecocentric shift is inevitable. I think it's an attitude, um, and I think it's inevitable. The question is, when does it happen fully, and what does it really look like? I think that's where we're at. So, rights of nature is no longer a concept. Rights of nature is here. <clears throat> so the question is, how does it get articulated? How does it shape behavior? Because ultimately it's about behavior. I think to what Ritesh has said earlier and what we've been trying to get to, which may not have been expressed uh, super clearly is this is deep culture work um, of which the legal is a part of it. Because uh, I think we have, at least in the United States, we've become very obedient to laws and rules and you know we're a, we're a land of laws well what is a law it's just a rule it's just an articulation of a value um, and if those values are not working for us or those values were actually never really the kind of values that should have taken hold uh, then we have to sort of shift that orientation and I think this is largely what this work is about which is really about do we have the belief that we can do it so it's a confidence thing um, so I think we've moved beyond it being just a concept. We're in the, the realm of what does it look like and how do we make it happen? And the, how we make it happen also to what Ritesh was talking to earlier is sure policy, sure laws through the kind of normal means of legislation, but 
we need to be ready to do things in an unconventional way. We supposedly have big brains. Well, let's use them and let's not be afraid to use them, which means extra jurisdictional stuff uh, because ultimately big systems are big systems for a reason. They're very well entrenched. They're very hard to move. They have a certain way of doing things. Um, and so we've, we've got a ways to go. So we have to be creative and smart about how we get there and sort of collapse the old way, the old paradigm and make sure that the new paradigm has a place to grow from, which the last point I'll make as being involved in this work for, for many, many years now is rights of nature also has become very sort of sexy. <laughs> you know, people love talking about rights of nature and I love nature and I love being in nature and that's great. I mean, that's all a big piece of it, but we also have to be aware that there's other realities to make sure that are integrated with with the articulation of those rights, like the fact that local communities, traditional knowledge, the ability to locally self-determine, self-govern is critical to making rights of nature reality, which means greater citizen involvement, citizen enforcement, because we know that humans are fallible and we have to have me methods of checking one another. And if we just embed it in a national framework thinking that, well, they're gonna somehow take care of it, I think we're, that's where, again, the articulation of rights of nature falls flat. In addition, we clearly need to restrict the capability of human endeavors, especially when it comes to commercial activity, which in this country and elsewhere in the world, uh, corporations have tremendous amount of legal power beyond their economic power, beyond their political power. And we have to temper that. Uh, we have to restrain that in considerable ways. Otherwise, it will find a way to get around it, over it, under it, or morph or mutate or water down the realities of what we're looking for. Because um, I think in a lot of ways, the capitalism model is a representation of the worst of human greed. And if we don't actually find ways to temper that along with the articulation of rights, we do a disservice to the natural world, again, as Ritesh said, that we are a part of. And so there's a lot of things moving together and we can't forget that. We have a big task ahead of us Again, I think it's an inevitable, it's just a matter of how we do it.